Tonight, Russia rains down fire on Kyiv. A message from Moscow as world leaders meet. We're on the ground in Ukraine as Canadian rescue crews work. This really traumatic experience. And a hot mic moment, poking fun at Putin. <laughs> on both sides of the border, protest as abortion rights fall in the United States. It's just about human rights. And while pride parades march through major cities, the concern about what could come next. I'm afraid that they might come for us. And how did more than 20 young people die in a South African bar? The tragic mystery unfolding tonight. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Today, the Russian army unleashed 14 missiles on Kyiv, striking the city for the first time in weeks. Yet another wave of destruction and at least one more person killed. Among the injured, a seven-year-old girl. All of this while G7 leaders strove to present a united international front against Vladimir Putin. At the summit, Justin Trudeau was among those caught on mic mocking the Russian president. But there's no doubting the gravity of this moment. The forces at play, it seems, will only escalate. We begin in Ukraine, where missiles struck well beyond the capital. Chris Brown is in Kharkiv tonight, and he shows us the immediate awful aftermath and meets Canadians lending a hand amid the horror. Russia unleashed a swarm of missiles on Ukraine, which fell all weekend. Kyiv was struck several times, destroying a central apartment building in the Shevchenkivsky district and sparking a furious rescue effort. We know the couple of people inside. <laughs> this woman was nearly crushed to death by falling concrete, but was saved. Another person didn't make it. A kindergarten building a few hundred meters away was also destroyed. The capital has recently filled up again, with people returning home, and this was the first time it had been targeted in weeks. Russia struck at other cities, too. Here in Kharkiv, it is Russian artillery and missile strikes that are destroying homes and lives. Russian troops are only 20 kilometers from this city and have renewed efforts to push even closer. Here, three families had already moved out, but one woman and her husband had a very lucky escape. Mm. A catastrophe happened, said Ola Bidenko. We didn't hear the explosion or even the whistle of the missiles, but two walls collapsed around us and the ceiling came down. Neighbors spent the morning trying to salvage whatever they could for her. Russian missiles also hit a high-rise and a medical centre in Kharkiv, too. These Canadians from Alberta have been witnesses to the violence for weeks. They've been assisting in rescue operations at Russian targets from shopping malls to schools. There was children's paintings uh, all over the ground. All that effort will now be lost to the elements as we threw them in the garbage. What a waste. Will Arsenault's role was to scale buildings and then make them safer by knocking off dangerous bits of concrete. I'm not going to lie, it's going to be a struggle coming from this, going back to uh, my home, uh, knowing everyone's safe there. It'll be an adjustment. As I still cannot comprehend uh, how is it possible, how is it possible that this is happening. It's just a really traumatic experience. Russia, meanwhile, showed its top soldier, Sergei Shoigu, inspecting his troops. After they captured the Donbass city of Severodonetsk, some wondered if Russia might take a pause. Instead, all of these strikes might suggest escalation. Chris Brown, CBC News, Kharkiv. The devastation in Ukraine echoed in southern Germany, where G7 leaders sought ways to put more pressure on Russia. David Cochran shows us the diplomatic front, along with a mocking moment among the leaders. As Russian rockets rain down on Kyiv, the G7 gathers in the Bavarian Alps to discuss new ways to help Ukraine, with some talking candidly about the strain of the war. We're here in Germany with the richest countries in the world focusing on, uh, on Ukraine and how to, how to keep that coalition of support for Ukraine together at a time when you know, realistically, that there is going to be fatigue in, in populations and, and politicians. Fatigue as the fallout of the Russian invasion cascades through the world economy, driving up food and fuel prices. 
But while Boris Johnson underscored the serious challenges of the time, he was also caught on mic using this gathering to make fun of the main antagonist. With Prime Minister Trudeau jumping in. A not-so-subtle reference to this viral image of the Russian leader from 2009. As for the actual work at this summit, Canada announced $50 million to help Ukraine boost grain storage capacity as it struggles with Russian blockades. And with three other countries, sanctioned Russian gold exports in an attempt to further pressure and punish the Kremlin. But sanctions take a long time to really work. And their effect has been undermined by countries invited to this summit as guests. India has joined China as an enthusiastic buyer of Russian oil, taking some of the bite out of the sanctions. Though like-minded leaders remain undeterred. With G7 countries, we all share the same goals. To cut the oxygen from Russia's war machine while taking care of our economies. The challenge is how to do that without inflicting more pain on their own economies. The other pressing issue here, finding some way to secure the release of Ukraine's grain stores, which are vital to the global food supply. On that point, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will speak to G7 leaders on Monday. David Cochran, CBC News, Gamish Pettenkirchen, Germany. At least four people are dead in Colombia after a stadium partially collapsed during a bullfighting event. It happened southwest of the capital, Bogota. A lot of people were there. The cameras were rolling when a section of the stands caved in. According to local media, among the dead were two women, a man and a child. Dozens of others were injured. In South Africa, an investigation is underway after at least 20 teenagers mysteriously died at a bar. It happened early this morning. As Susanna De Silva reports, while there are many theories, tonight there are a few answers for the devastated families. Crowds gathered outside as investigators worked to piece together what happened and what killed at least 20 teenagers inside a bar they weren't even supposed to be in, with theories ranging from trampled in a stampede to alcohol poisoning. This Twitter video claims to show what the Enyo Beni Tavern looked like early Sunday morning, a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder outdoor area and a crowded indoor dance floor. This man tweeted video of the busy scene near an indoor stage packed with people last night. The tavern is located in a small community on South Africa's east coast, and only those 18 and above are allowed inside. But officials say the victims range in age from 13 to 17, reportedly there to celebrate the end of winter exams a celebration that turned into a crime scene, enough to bring South Africa's Minister of Police to tears. The scene I, I've seen here inside, it takes, it doesn't matter what kind of a heart you have. Uh, the, firstly, the sight of those bodies sleeping there, but when you look at their faces, you realize that they're dealing with kids, 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 kids. Uh, you have heard the story that they are young, but when you see them, you realize that is a disaster. Officials say samples are being sent 1,000 kilometers away to Cape Town for toxicology testing as autopsies are conducted, with some officials saying it is unlikely the dead were trampled. Efforts also continue to identify all the victims and notify their devastated families, with officials promising to get them answers. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Abortion rights demonstrations are continuing across the United States and here as well, two days after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. Protests popped up at Pride events and elsewhere today. Both those against and for the ruling are scrambling now to react. And as Paul Hunter shows us, for many in the streets this weekend, anger over the court's ruling is mixing with fear of what could happen next. For countless Americans this weekend, still stunned by Friday's Supreme Court decision, rage. This Supreme Court thinks that they can put a law on this land that the majority of this country does not support that will strip away the basic human rights of over half of the people living here. I'm mad. Demonstrating in city upon city for the right now lost and others now deemed at risk. The fear at today's Pride Parade in New York was, what's next? 
after one justice called on the court to reconsider other rulings, including one on same-sex marriage. I'm afraid with what just happened and how easy it happened that they might come for us. On abortion access, think about Michigan, where there's a Democrat governor but Republican lawmakers. They want abortion to be a felony, no exceptions for rape or incest. That's the kind of legislature that I'm working with. Some U.S. corporations are already putting travel expenses for abortions into their health care plans. Some Canadian companies with U.S. workers are doing likewise. In Democrat Washington state, today this pledge to women across the U.S. We will make Washington state a sanctuary state for the right of choice here in the state of Washington for other citizens as well. But already there are signals where this debate is headed. Consider this abortion rights rally this weekend in Rhode Island. And in Mississippi, at the clinic where the challenge to Roe v. Wade began. Don't kill your baby. Don't kill your baby. Don't kill your baby. Abortion opponents shouted at women going inside this weekend, with the clinic now set to close within days. Say both sides, the battling will now only grow. I believe we have turned to Jesus today. So, Paul, so much happening right now, but people are also focused on what might happen next. Ian, it's as if everyone's staring into the abyss right now with worries that different states will do different things, leaving confusion everywhere. Banned after 15 weeks, banned after six weeks, depends where you are. Even in cases of incest or rape, it depends. Just today, the Republican governor of South Dakota, for example, suggested she'll try to restrict access to abortion pills in the mail. People worry states will somehow try to prevent women from crossing state lines. Is that even possible? Could it be blocked? What can Joe Biden do about any of it? The U.S. right now, Ian, has been turned upside down on all of this. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. When many people think about abortions, their minds might go to clinics or hospitals. But in the U.S., most now happen with pills, not procedures. Over the last two decades, use of medication abortions has been steadily growing, hitting an estimated 54% in 2020. And since then, the pills have become easier to get access to, with the FDA now allowing them to be mailed out. Medication abortions are available here in Canada, too. But as Peggy Lamb explains, access can prove challenging in rural areas. It's not this huge, deep, dark secret. Eight months after having a medical abortion, Vanessa Whitbread is speaking out. The Manitoban lives 600 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Last year, it took her nearly three weeks to get the abortion pill Mifugaimiso because initially there wasn't a practitioner near her willing to prescribe it. I was already at like week seven, going into week eight, and so I started to panic. In Canada, doctors can prescribe the pill to those up to 10 weeks pregnant. The director of this women's health centre in Winnipeg says a prescription can be hard to get because many doctors who provide abortion services don't publicize it, making it tough for women in rural areas to seek them out. Or they don't prescribe mifugaimiso because they lack knowledge. Abortion is not something that's taught in medical school. That to me is outrageous, um, which is part of the problem. In southern Alberta, a pro-choice advocacy group has been reaching out to doctors with hopes more will start offering the pill. They sent out educational kits to 700 doctors, only eight committed to prescribe it. Many physicians are concerned around here um, that if they openly are prescribing methodiniso or openly supporting surgical abortions, that they are putting their life at risk. Experts say that having doctors provide Mifugamiso prescriptions virtually can help improve access. But most importantly, they want more physicians in rural areas committed to signing it off. Adding to their hurdles, many pharmacies in rural areas don't carry the drug, making it hard to find even if a patient can get a prescription. Peggy Lam, CBC News, Winnipeg. In the wake of the U.S. ruling, some Canadians took to the streets this weekend to voice their support for abortion rights. In Montreal today, hundreds gathered to condemn the U.S. decision and show solidarity with Americans. It's just really important to stand together and to try to, you know, just show support. 
That message shared by protesters Saturday in Halifax. It's our body, it's our health care, it's our life. And at a rally in downtown Toronto. Hundreds of people gathered outside the U.S. consulate, some with very personal reasons for showing up. I was super fortunate to be able to access the abortion service provider when I needed it. While support for Americans was the main message, advocates also called for better abortion access in Canada. We're going to talk more about abortion access in this country in just a bit and also speak to the son of a pioneering activist. Dr. Henry Morgenthaler fought for decades to change Canada's abortion laws, eventually winning at the Supreme Court of Canada. Just ahead, his son reflects on that time and the latest U.S. ruling. Toronto marked pride today by celebrating its first parade since the pandemic began. But there are still concerns within the gay community about protecting safe spaces and hard-won rights. Tally Ricci reports. At this year's Pride Parade, thousands partied like it was 2019. I think it's incredible that this many people came out. Pride was on pause for two years during the pandemic. The community hit hard by restrictions. Many important LGBTQ gathering venues were forced to close. This year, huge crowds greeted the return of the in-person parade. It's just another form of communication, just to meet in person and just to say hi, like we've missed you. Some celebrated their first Pride ever. I am now 66. I came out at 65. All my life I was terrified. Now I'm free. It's so incredible. But this year's festivities are set against some troubling events. Earlier this month, police in Idaho arrested more than two dozen members of a white supremacist group near a Pride event. And this weekend, Oslo's Pride Parade was cancelled after a gunman killed two people and injured more than 20 during the capital's Pride Festival. We made the decision to enhance our security prior to the shooting in Norway, but it really confirmed why we're doing what we're doing. Organizers say that's only more reason to attend Pride events. The executive director of Pride says gathering like this is a celebration, but it's also a protest. To really send the message that there are two LGBTQ members across the globe that are still not free to be themselves. One of the organizers of the first ever Toronto Pride Parade in 1972 reflects on how this day felt 50 years ago. There were only 200 people who gathered for the, the first Pride Parade. It all seems, you know, incredible to me now. Many are looking forward to future Pride celebrations together. Be yourself. You only have one life. I can say I love myself. And beforehand, I couldn't. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Turkey broke up a Pride March again this year, attended by hundreds of people. Thousands used to attend Pride in Istanbul, but it was banned in 2015 when the government toughened its stance on LGBTQ expression. While being gay is not illegal in Turkey, homophobia is described by many as being widespread. Some LGBTQ Canadians are calling out airlines for what they call rainbow washing during Pride Month. They say the airlines put out inclusive messages while still requiring passengers to specify their gender. Sophia Harris has more. A WestJet TikTok video celebrating Pride Month. Flair Airlines is marking it too. And Air Transit is incorporating the rainbow colors. But not everyone is on board. It's 2022 and it's still happening. Non-binary people, including Is Lloyd, are upset with some airlines for waving the pride flag without offering a gender neutral X option when booking flights. Instead, passengers must choose male or female. Sorry, on WestJet, we can only fly if we know exactly what is in between your legs. Lloyd posted this TikTok video after being forced to identify as male or female to check in online for a WestJet flight. Companies are really bad with rainbow washing of, you know, we're so inclusive, we're so good, look at us, give us money. Like, we are the best. Um, but if you aren't actually putting in the work, you don't get to say that. Well, this is my passport. It says X for my gender. Transgender activist Gemma Hickey is also non-binary. Hickey got that passport in 2018 and is still waiting for many airlines to adopt the X gender category. It feels like I'm not 
part of society. I'm not, I'm not represented. Transport Canada says airlines must collect gender information, but that they can accept gender X. Porter Airlines has offered the X option since 2018. WestJet, Air Transit and Flair Airlines say they plan to offer it soon. Air Canada has offered a gender-neutral option since late 2019 when booking flights online. It aims to add the option at check-in next month. Take the steps uh, necessary to make these changes as soon as possible because there's no excuse. Several airlines said the technical changes required are complex and some blame the delay on the pandemic. I'm seeing a stir. Hickey hopes that by next year's Pride Month, all the airline's gender options will align with their pride marketing. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. For some Canadians, inflation is changing summer plans. We have also, like, you know, have to cut the travel because the air ticket is pretty expensive. Under pressure, what the finance minister told CBC News. It's okay to be mad at me. Oh, that nice. Cricket is taking off, but the spaces to play are not. That does not even meet the demand that we're facing today, much less 20 years from today. And behold, guerrilla gardening. We'll tell you about the concept that's changing urban landscapes. A lot of things divide us, but flowers definitely bring us together. We're back after this. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Canadians are dealing with rising temperatures and soaring prices this summer. And with the inflation rate now at nearly a four-decade high, many are being forced to rethink their summer plans. David Thurton shows us the government isn't planning more measures to help yet. Dragon races pushing hard. On the water, these paddlers fight the power of the river at the Ottawa Dragon Boat Race Festival. Off the water, they're battling something else. I would say cost of living affect everyone. Okay. Like Canadians across the country, the skyrocketing cost of food and fuel is forcing them to make changes to their summer plans. We have also, like, you know, have to cut the travel because the air ticket is pretty expensive. Honestly, without the banks or the credits and then you pay it back, it's hard to live only with your salary. This is the first summer for many without pandemic restrictions, but instead of a summer without COVID, it's turning into a summer of high prices. In an interview on Rosemary Barton Live, the finance minister says she understands the frustration. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be mad at me. With living costs rising, the finance minister has been accused by the opposition of not doing enough touting a package of measures announced in the last budget that amounts to $8.9 billion to help some of the hardest hit by rising costs. Conservatives say the government should spend less and cut fuel taxes instead. Look, every time they reject a suggestion by Conservatives, they think it hurts us, it actually hurts Canadians. The NDP leader says what low-income families need is direct help in the form of GST rebates and the Canada Child Benefit. We know families are, are cancelling trips to visit their relatives because they can't afford to. We know people are putting back groceries because they can't afford to buy it. Freeland says she's cautious about pouring more money into the economy. I am mindful uh, when it comes to dealing with inflation, I have to strike a balance. But Freeland told CBC News she hasn't ruled out further action, with hopes the government and the central bank can row in unison to make life more affordable for Canadians. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. A man is in custody after four people were stabbed, one of them fatally, in downtown Montreal this morning. Police say a 26-year-old appeared to be in mental distress, attacking his mother with a sharp object and his stepfather, who was pronounced dead at the scene. Another woman and a security guard were also attacked. The victims are in hospital in stable condition. Work is underway at the Cowess's First Nation in Saskatchewan to reclaim and honour their long-dead children. This week marked one year since the chief there announced that hundreds of potential unmarked graves had been detected at the site of a former residential school. Well, Myra Issa shows us the challenges ahead. For the children who never made it home, 751 unmarked graves were discovered here last year at the site of the former Maryville Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan. The last year, 
has been tough on Kausis personally, um, to the world and to the country. It triggered a pain inside of many. For many survivors, the pain has been hard to carry as the road to healing is long and marked with questions. Oh, I have a little friend named Brian. Taken one night, never came back, never seen him again. You know, and nowadays you wonder, you know, is he one of them? Since the discovery of the graves, the community has been hard at work trying to answer those questions, to identify those buried, but it says it will not dig up the site. We want to put names to unmarked graves, have markers down there and have a place where people could come and, and heal if they have a loved one there. The First Nation is gathering data and working with historical records from the Roman Catholic Church and oral history to put names to the unmarked graves. Searches like the ones at Kawasis are happening in First Nations all across the country, and experts say they need support. So there are many communities right now that are seeking to conduct these ground penetrating radar surveys around their school locations. There are not enough people in Canada who have the necessary experience in how to use the technology to find our graves to meet the demand. It's Canada, we inherited this, but we have an obligation. To keep investigating and uncover the truth about what happened here. Omer Isa, CBC News, Kaosis First Nation in Saskatchewan. It was Dr. Henry Morgenthaler who went to jail and eventually to the Supreme Court of Canada for abortion rights. Coming up, the man who fought relentlessly for wider access and won. I'll speak with his son about Morgan Toller's legacy next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, how generations of Republican efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade are reflected in the Supreme Court's decision and what the unpopular ruling means for the court's legitimacy. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. A lot of reactions in the United States, fear, outrage, even jubilation after Friday's stunning Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The effects are far-reaching and the decision has sparked renewed concern about protecting access to abortion here in Canada. Martha Painter is an author, a registered nurse as well, who provides abortion care. She is in Halifax. And Martha, of course, abortion is a, it's a legal medical procedure in Canada, but access does depend on where you live. And so tell us, for example, the challenges for women in the Maritimes. We talk about patients and use gender-inclusive language, pregnant people. And we've made some major inroads since 2015 in the Maritimes with the introduction of self-referral in both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and the opening of a comprehensive clinic in PEI. So there's been really tremendous gains in terms of access, not to mention the fact that medication abortion was approved by Health Canada in 2015 and now makes up between 30 to 50% of the abortion care through primary care offices. So while there are, of course, always challenges for people living in poverty, experiencing gender violence, threatened by racism within the healthcare system, we have made tremendous gains that people should know about. The Prime Minister on Friday said, and this is a quote, I want women in Canada to know that we will always stand up for your right to choose. When it comes to access to abortion, concretely, are there things the government should be doing? Absolutely. That government is overdue for um, fulfilling their promise for pharmacare. If we had public funding for contraception, that would be a tremendously important uh, element of reproductive health care. Uh, also, this government could re revoke the charitable status of the hundreds and hundreds of crisis pregnancy centers that distribute misinformation and terrorize patients. How do you think the ruling in the United States will affect discussion about abortion here in Canada? We're always worried that our patients will um, be misinformed and not know how to get care. So this is a time to be very vocal about how abortion really works here. And it's also a time for more people to join it, 
in particular in primary care, to take mifepristone prescribing into their practice to expand access. And we're also always worried about escalating anti-choice uh, extremist rhetoric and how that might affect our patients' confidence. So we want patients to rest assured that as providers, we are here for them. Abortion care is normal, safe, common, and they will be well cared for by providers in Canada. Tonight on the program, we're obviously talking about abortion now in Canada, access to abortion and in the future, but we also want to look back in terms of history as well. And so when I say Dr. Henry Morgenthaler to you, what comes to mind? Henry Morgenthaler's 1988 uh, ruling um, really was the moment when decriminalization in Canada happened. And until the recent decriminalization in New Zealand, Canada was alone in the world for having that status of care, that um, abortion is health, it's a health service, it's not legal or illegal, it's just health care like antibiotics or a knee replacement. And that really, his leadership for decades, from the 60s through to his death in 2013, um, he, he made, it was formidable work, and we're all very grateful for it. Um, I personally volunteered at his clinics and for his legal defense fund in New Brunswick. Uh, so he's, he's a hero to us all. Martha Painter, thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. My pleasure. So let's talk a little bit more now about Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, a Holocaust survivor. He believed passionately in protecting human rights and worked for decades to expand abortion services for Canadians. He opened his first clinic in 1969, then many more. Twice he challenged the constitutionality of the federal abortion law in the Supreme Court of Canada, and he won the second time in 1988. Dr. Henry Morgenthaler passed away in 2013. Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler is his son, and he's in Sarasota, Florida. Dr. Morgenthaler, I know you've thought about this. Uh, how do you think your father would have reacted to the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in the United States? Well, I, I think he would have rolled up his sleeves, um, held a press conference, and said that the fight has to go on. Um, you know, it's it's an amazing thing. You know, I'm not sure that that many people in Canada know this, but Roe v. Wade plays a big role in Canada's story because it was when the Roe v. Wade decision came down in 1973 that my father decided it was time to raise the stakes regarding abortion in Canada. And, um, you know, he had been first arrested with his clinic raided in 1970 um, but nothing really was happening with the legal cases. There was kind of a standoff, if you will. He was servicing the community of Montreal, uh, getting referrals from the hospitals, taking care of the wives, girlfriends, daughters of politicians and policemen. And it was sort of status quo was OK at the time. Um, and then when Roe v. Wade happened, uh, he performed an abortion on uh, the television show W5. And that escalated everything, and he was raided again soon afterward, and his jury trials began after that. Your dad went to jail for providing abortions. Tell us about the impact that had on, on him, but on you as well. Well, that was huge for the family. You know, my, uh, you know, my father was a well-respected physician. Uh, he had won a jury trial, and off he went uh, to prison despite all of that. It wasn't just being in prison, but there also was no money. The government of Quebec was really coming after him and froze all his assets. I was at university in the United States at Harvard, and there was no money left. So I ended up needing to apply for loans and scholarship and worked uh, and worked odd jobs on campus. And my father ended up going first to, uh, believe it or not, maximum security prison at Bordeaux, where he was allowed one visitor for one hour once a week. Um, no contact with uh, family or anybody. It was really uh, just an incredible, awful experience. He was acquitted time and again by a jury, but one time in appeal court, and at that point you could do this in Canada, an appeal court overturned the jury acquittal. That's how he ended up going to prison. But of course, eventually he won his case in the Supreme Court of Canada. Just before that happened in 1988, I actually went to visit him at his office here in Toronto, and let me play an excerpt from that interview. 
if the decision is, um, is a good one, uh, it'll be the culmination of uh, my life's work, in a sense. It'll be a tremendous victory for women across the country. Uh, they will no longer have to feel the anxiety and the real fear of being stranded in a province where they cannot get a medical abortion. So, of course, he did win that. And since then, the, there is no criminal law in Canada on abortion. Uh, what should we th be thinking about tonight when we think about your dad? Well, you know, I think with my father, you know, he'd been through the concentration camps and he'd really experienced firsthand the indignities of uh, what man can do to man, or perhaps in this case, what man can do to, to women. And it was really his life's mission to do good in this world. And he found his cause with abortion. Uh, it, it wasn't just on a political basis. You know, he, was, he felt like he was doing something marvelous to the women who came into his office, distressed, uncertain what to do, rattled by the protesters outside. And it was really his human kindness in the end uh, that really came to the fore. Uh, this is really a story, in my opinion, not only of human rights, but of kindness to other human beings. Dr. Morgenthaler, real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you. After the break and change of pace, there's a cricket boom happening in Canada. But if you try to sign up, you may be out of luck. And how farm animals and baseball are getting kids into rural schools. Next. And the Avalanche are 2022 Stanley Cup champions. And with that, the Colorado Avalanche have won the Stanley Cup. Tampa took an early lead in the game, but the Avs came back to win 2-1. Tampa, of course, had won the last two Stanley Cups. For Colorado, this is their first championship in 21 years. And a bit of Canadian content, Calgary-born Kale McCarr won the Conn Smythe Trophy for playoff MVP. The City of Toronto is facing a growing supply crunch, but our next story is not what you might think. There's been such a surge in demand to play cricket that the city doesn't have enough pitches. Stephen D'Souza looks at the sport's rising popularity and the calls for more support. From the moment work is out on Friday afternoon, the players are on the pitch. Cricket has been growing steadily in Canada for decades, fueled by those whose love of the game is rooted around the world, now flourishing here. Players from different parts of the world are united on the same team because of cricket. In many parts of Toronto, cricket is no longer a colourful curiosity. It's taken centre stage. In the last seven years, this league in Scarborough has tripled its membership. But for every player that suits up, there are thousands more waiting. The city can't keep up with demand. Spaces designed for cricket just aren't there. If you drive across the city, you'll see empty soccer fields, you'll see empty baseball diamonds. It's all empty, whereas you see cricket fields are packed. And he says even those facilities they do have are old and run down. Adding to the frustration in Toronto, just next door in Brampton, a cricket haven is blossoming. Brand new fields with new bleachers, scoreboards, even lights to play at night. It's not just the wide open spaces that make the fields in Brampton special, it's the little details. Take a look at the grass, cut to half an inch, the same standard you'd find on an international pitch. If you build it, they will come. Problem is, even Brampton can't build fast enough. It's just crazy. Like, to stop registration for the summer season in November of last year, I don't think any, anybody does that. Here, too, empty baseball diamonds sit next door, something the mayor is eager to fix. I think Canada uh, is seeing this incredible interest, incredible momentum in cricket. This is not 1972 anymore, and our country's recreation needs to reflect that. It's not just big cities seeing the game grow. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, a melting pot of players have made this league a Sunday afternoon fixture. From New Zealand, Australia, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, UAE. Even on a borrowed field, these players have big dreams. 
If there is a will, there is a way. So we are we are on it, we are into it, but we have a lot of talented players here and trying to make a great team. Back in Toronto, the city is working with cricket leagues, but the current plan, just five new fields in the next 20 years. That does not even meet the demand that we're facing today, much less 20 years from today. So we need more involvement, we need more attention. From sharing fields to finding new green spaces, the players hope there will be room for the next generation to grow. I, I wish my son uh, can just one day get up and be like playing this team, no problem. Until then, they'll keep going, hoping new spaces to play are just on the horizon. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. From one field of dreams to another. In Alberta, a school principal is seen as the driving force to reimagine and revitalize two rural, remote schools. And he's turned to agriculture and baseball as a way to do it. Brian Labby has more. There's not much in Alterio, Alberta. The old grain elevator stands watch over a community with fewer than 40 people. The hotel has been closed for years. The gas station and convenience store are long gone. Good morning, Alterio School. But the local public school is undergoing a resurgence. It's happening in part because of these sheep, cows and chickens. This farm operation behind the school is Alterio's Agriculture Academy an addition to the school conceived by Principal Kevin Van Lagen, who calls himself the Prairie Principal. And the main theme here in, in Ontario was uh, agriculture. And everyone said, you know, that's what we do well, let's celebrate it, let's embrace it, and can we bring agriculture into our school in some way, shape, or form. So that was really the beginning of reviving the school to a point of that where we are today where we say we're actually thriving. Enrollment is now at 67, a small number for a K-12 school, but it's more than double expected enrollment. About half an hour away, near another school run by Van Lagen, a baseball academy is boosting enrollment. Leif Wilson moved from Manitoba to attend and has already been recruited by a U.S. college. I'm going to get the experience playing junior college baseball and I'd hope to transfer to a four-year program and continue my baseball career and hopefully make it to professional baseball. The academy is also playing a role in boosting minor league baseball registration. In nearby concert, 160 kids have signed up in a village of 700. Those big boys in the school, they've been pretty good role models to these kids and the kids over at the other diamond. So I think that everybody just wants to, to play baseball. Perfect. Back at the Alterio School, longtime teacher Maggie Byer says her prairie principal is a visionary. Rebuilding our community, rebuilding our school, it's been actually quite amazing to see how it's grown. Van Lagen says he's now working on a new project, a student-led hydroponic growing operation that could one day produce enough vegetables to feed 150 families. Another way to see his schools, his students, and these communities continue to grow. Brian Labby, CBC News, Ontario, Alberta. Meanwhile, one woman is taking her gardening skills to the streets. When I first began the garden, uh, there was a city person who came by and she asked if uh, what I was doing and I said, well, uh... Planting flowers, gorilla style. Next. An Edmonton woman is spreading the word about making her city more beautiful after she noted to her husband that their walk to the bus stop didn't have to be so drab. She got into what's called guerrilla gardening, planting flowers in a place that isn't really yours. Fittingly, her name is Monica Grove, and her initiative is our moment. And I just went for it and just started to plant flowers, cleaned it up, put soil in, and then put flowers and seeds in, and enlisted a lot of people in my community uh, to be a part of this. It's become a bit of a, a, a source of pride for this neighborhood. When I first began the garden, uh, there was a city person who came by and she asked if uh, what I was doing and I said, well, uh, well, uh, and I was holding my shovel and she said, well, no, you're not in trouble. But at one point during the pandemic, city staff pulled out the plants thinking they were weeds. At that time, we needed even more beauty, more, more reasons for joy. So Monica took care to plant flowers, not seedlings, and it's a blooming success. And a lot of things divide us, but flowers definitely bring us together. So my wife did a version of this with bulbs in Vancouver, but I probably shouldn't disclose any more than that. Uh, but 
kind of worked out nicely. Uh, in Edmonton, though, that initiative got so big that City Council passed a bylaw allowing, and I think I have this word right, boulevardening. So kind of a neat idea. That is the National for June 26th. Good night.